Welcome to Measures of Truth, a His Dark Materials podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. I'm Francis. And I'm Anya, and today we're discussing chapters 9 through 11 of The Subtle Knife, the second book in the His Dark Materials trilogy. In chapter 9, Theft, we are back at the cafe in hmm, Chitagate. Uh, Lyra dresses Will's wounds, which are still bleeding as profusely as when his fingers were first cut off. Will and Lyra make their way to Sir Charles' house in Will's world, but by moving through Chitagate and cutting small holes to check their relative location. When they arrive at the Limefield house, no one is there, and Will begins the burglary. He cuts his way into the study, but the alethiometer is missing from the expected cabinet. Then Sir Charles, aka Lord Boreal, duh, 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 arrives back at the house, along with the alethiometer and a surprise guest. Ruth Wilson! I mean, Mrs. Coulter! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Will hides behind the couch and eavesdrops while Lyra fixes his bandage and then goes to create a diversion. Lyra uses a rock to break the study window, allowing Will to grab the alethiometer, jump through his window into Chitagatse, and close it behind him. Mrs. Coulter and Sir Charles go outside to investigate. Miraculously, the rescue tabby cat that's been following Will and Lyra attacks Mrs. Coulter's golden monkey, enabling Lyra to escape back into Chitagatse through the other window they'd left before Will closes it. In chapter 10, The Shaman, Lee stores his balloon in a warehouse and sets off down a river to continue searching for Grumman. His Tartar guide says that they've been expecting him and that he's arrived to take Grumman, who is a shaman, to another world. When Lee and Grumman first meet, Grumman shocks Lee by showing that he is in possession of a ring that once belonged to Lee's mother and saying that he used it to summon him. Grumman tells Lee his life story the life story of one John Perry, a.k.a. father of Will Perry, da, 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 and says that Lee's task is to take him into Chigatsa to meet the knife bearer. Lee agrees to this as long as the knife is ultimately used to protect Lyra. Lee and Grumman return to town to find it overtaken by Magisterium soldiers. Lee uses the ring that he stole off the dead Magisterium censor to get his balloon back, and they make a hasty escape amid gunfire. And in chapter 11, The Belvedere, when Lyra and Will wake up in the fancy mansion where they crashed for the night, Will is in bad shape. His hand is swollen and angry, and he still hasn't stopped bleeding. They talk about their respective mummy and daddy issues, and discuss possible strategies before deciding to use the alethiometer to get more information. Lyra asks about Will's mum, and then reports that she's safe. She begins to ask about his father, when the house is suddenly attacked by the town's band of child hooligans who are angry that Tulio is dead because of Lyra and Will, they claim. They escape out the back and try to make a run for it, but Will is weak and can barely run, so they don't do that. They barricade themselves instead in an old temple and try to use the knife to escape. Will makes a cut into his world and is horrified to realise that they are in fact high in the air above a busy road because they climbed a hill. The children are relentless and bent on murder, but just as all seems lost, Seraphina's Goose, I mean falcon demon, Kaiser, appears, oh. Oh, <laughs> soon to be followed by witches armed with arrows, causing the children to flee in fear. The witches note that the spectres are avoiding Will, and he realises that it's because of the knife. They split up to lose the spectres and rendezvous at a nearby cave to camp for the night. The witches begin working a spell to he- help heal Will's hand. But will they succeed? Probably. <laughs> 
this chapter and Seraphina reminded me that I don't hate all witches, and that was really nice. Yeah. They are a mixed bag. It's just hard after spending so much time with Ruta. She all does right. suck. She does, yes. Let's let us not forget, even though she's not in these chapters. <laughs> we gotta run her down. She still is. Yeah. <laughs> we know that she's there. Now for the military portion of our program, we go to general feelings. Thank you, General, for yes, your service. So <laughs> I always start my section with I agree with blank, so I don't have to start the section. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, I really like how all over the place these chapters are. Like we go from one chapter that is literally like a little mini um heist story to one that's like let's discuss our pasts to a, like an escape lord of the flies type uh, chapter <laughs> and they feel very episodic but also they didn't feel they didn't feel unconnected like i liked how it was all done these are great chapters for like as short as they are like they feel really punchy to me and there's lots of tension yeah they just kind of flew by for me when I was going through them and I think it shows off like how talented Pullman is there's a great line when Serafina shows up about like the uh, arrows coming down like hammer blows like the thunder of hammer blows and the kids stop and all of the anger bleeds out of them and like that's all very evocative um, and everything's moving forward in a way where the plot is tightening and it all feels character driven and just all of that stuff's not easy to do, but he's like spinning all these plates. Like you said, it, it feels like it fits together, even though it's like kind of all over the place and that's impressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I hate to be like, I agree with Alan, but. I agree with Alan. <laughs> yeah, it's really well crafted. Every single bit is advancing the story in a meaningful but small and well crafted manner. And it, it, it again, it reminds me of the sort of thriller movie tension style thing where it keeps you engaged and it really is, you're just waiting as this tension slowly builds and it's, it's almost like uh, the equivalent of negative space where the la if everything's constantly going the whole time it's a michael bay movie and thus it's relatively boring but if it's kind of, if you've got those times when you get to breathe and you really get to recover then the contrast is so much nicer but they still keep on ratcheting it up just a little bit i really like that yeah i agree with what everyone else has already said i think last week and this week are basically my favorite parts of this book i think the pacing here is great like really cool exciting things are happening we're finally getting to see the knife in action which is nice because it's the title of the book um and it really seems like the perfect tool um for will and lyra at this point in the book it's like powerful but it doesn't feel overpowered either like pullman manages um to put them in situations where the knife is really key but also there's like it still feels like threatening and difficult in this section, we also get two big character reveals that help connect Will and Lyra's worlds more than we previously thought. Putting them kind of back to back helps them reflect on each other in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Agreed. I never, I never really connected those two character reveals, but I guess they are literally back to back. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really think about it when I was just reading through for fun. But this time, since I was taking notes for the podcast, I was like, huh think that was well done i meant to say earlier that i was thankful when we were doing the summaries that you gave me the mrs coulter chapter i appreciate that oh <laughs> that was not on purpose i just always give you the first one. Oh well but in future it will be on purpose <laughs> yeah yeah speaking of i think that's a good segue into our favorite part because of course my favorite part is that my favorite bitch is back <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> Not that crappy bitch from last time, but the good bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the goodest of bitches. Well done. Yeah. And she's already like causing problems. I I like she's been pulled into this other world and showing all this crazy shit and she's already like, "All right, how can I take advantage of this? How is this to my like how can I use all of this and get you under my control and get you under my control?" I love her. 
It's really good. It in it like it really in an instant it makes the stakes go up, right? Yeah. She she shows up and Will doesn't exactly know what's going on and Lyra's like, "Yo, we're fucked." Like <laughs> like <Yeah>. it's <laughs> you don't understand how everything just changed. <laughs> Record scratch. So this is me. <laughs> I'm sure you're wondering how I got here, but <laughs> Yeah, my favorite part this week uh, was the heist. I I always love a good heist, and this one does not disappoint. It has, like, the classic unanticipated snag and the plan, and then they have to improvise to get around it, um, and the knife works really well for them. Um, It's all just great. So in my head, the whole way through, in my head, the whole way through that scene, Will is just under his breath going, dun, 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 I'm like really sad now that Lyra's world doesn't have TV because Penn would absolutely like his personality wise would absolutely be like in, before Mrs. Coulter showed up he would be he would be singing the uh, the Mission Impossible song. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that would be really good. Yeah, my favorite part. I really like that for John Parry. There's this whole wonderful subplot going through the entire thing through the at least the first two books where there's a story that's happening elsewhere in the past and you're kind of piecing together the bits as you go and you go oh 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 that's and then you you eventually go oh that's john parry oh that's john parry oh shit like that's so big i just i just think it's a really good thing and then when you finally get there and you meet him and you say yep there we are that's this is the john parry and it, it makes him feel as renowned and as mystical in your mind as he is for all these people in this world. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. I do remember the first time reading this book because I like put the pieces together before the book gave me the answer, which is not something I usually do. So I remember being like, he's John Perry. And then the book was like, John Perry. And I was like, oh, I am the <laughs> smartest. <laughs> yeah, exactly the same. It was like, yeah. oh. Oh, uh, you, you were just saying Joe, Joe Parry, Joe Parry, Joe pa- jo Parry, John, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, that was going to be my question, actually, is how much do you think the reader is supposed to make that connection versus not? My inclination, just from reading the text, is that I think the reader is supposed to guess that John Perry is Grumman. And the reader is not supposed to guess that Sir Charles is Lord Boreal. Well, yeah, mm. because in the books, Lord Boreal is almost nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think when reading the books, if he said, "Hey, I'm Lord," Lord like the first time you find out that he is Lord Boreal, without going back to like check the gold is golden compass, you'd be like, "Who the fuck was that?" Because he has like two lines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Depending on the age of the reader, like, a really young reader might not have put the things together, but it's like, John Perry's an Arctic explorer, Grumman was also an Arctic explorer, one of them has, like, a super mysterious backstory, the other one disappeared. I think it's well done. I think the reader's supposed to come up with it, and that doesn't detract from it. Plot twists are nice, but it doesn't have to be a surprise to the reader. Like, a lot of... I see a lot of times people complaining about like, oh, I totally saw that coming. And it's like, well, sometimes you're supposed to see it coming. (laughs) Right. That doesn't mean a failure in the story. I think Francis is right in the way that he talks about this recontextualizes information from the very first scene that we ever get, Mm. right? Where Grumman's head comes out and that means something to everybody in the room and this like changes everything that has to do with that and in a way that's like whoa so it like it rocks the whole story in a way and then you know he's doing the same thing to lee in that scene who is kind of the person that we care about and we're anchored to where he's like oh yeah i used this ring and lee is like whoa where did you get that like he's you know reaching all the way back into the origin of his story too mm-hmm. and it's like yeah, you just feel but, like you, Francis said it perfectly. Like you just feel the gravity of that character, and you're you take him seriously. 
And even with the ring especially, because if you recall, Lee decided to go look for Grumman last book, and it did kind of come out of the blue. It was mm, just like, mm -hmm. mm, I don't think he's dead, so I'm going to go find him. It wasn't like, I'm going to go find him because we need him for this. You, you know, like he, and then all throughout this book, he's going through a lot and spending a lot of money and killing a man and all these things to find <laughs> Grumman. And he never really had a goal in mind other than find Grumman. So even the, the pulling out of the ring and saying, I summoned you, even if Philip Pullman did retcon that, it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And it feels right. I kind of wanted uh, him to have a sort of fourth wall breaking character in there. Um, uh, kind of similar to maybe Cabin in the Woods, if you've seen that, where someone suggests an obviously plot driving thing. Like, I should go and find Grumman. Someone else goes, Why? <laughs> what are you doing? That's mad. <laughs> Just have a pint. Like, come on. What? <laughs> we should split up. No, we shouldn't. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> Alan, it's you. Oh, Alan hasn't gone yet. Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. My favorite thing this time is the mob of murderous children. I really like how this kind of calls back into Lyra's history, how she was like doing pretend wars with the other kids at Oxford. And now it's like a real she's like, you know, swinging a piece of iron at these kids. And she's like, I should have murdered her yesterday. And she like means it. And it kind of links also into Will's identity as a murderer. That's how he sees himself. And he's also committed murder in a duel. This moment kind of links both Will and Lyra to their past and, and centers them in a way that I think is really interesting. And Sidigatse has been very creepy and horror story-ish, <clears throat> but not for the children. And so now it's like... You know, without adults around and without rules, they become like feral or something in a way that underlines that these children are just people. They're not sweet and innocent. That's like part of the point of this book, right? They're human beings. And to treat them otherwise is to like hold them back in their development and uh, do harm to them. So I like that too about Pullman, how he never underestimates children in his stories. Yeah. In, in For both good and bad. <laughs> I like that you brought up the whole thing about Will being a murderer and, and calling back to that scene where they first meet and Lyra's consulting the alethiometer and finding out that Will is a murderer. Like, she finds that comforting um, <laughs> and reassuring. And, you know, at the time when we were discussing it, I was just thinking about, you know, what that says about his character but i didn't even think about you know it's not just looking back at what he's done in the past it's looking forward right the fact that he has murdered someone before means that he's willing probably to do it again this section had the piece of prose um that i think leapt out at me the most um when they're in the belvedere and they cut down the stairwell um he says that they weren't individual children they were a single mass like a tide they surged below him and leaped up in fury snatching threatening screaming spitting but they couldn't reach um it's just like such an evocative description i love it's it it's really scary yeah it reminds me a bit of is it um i am legend yeah where they go to they go to israel for a bit and also just side note but Oh my God, I Am Legend is a terrible adaptation of an amazing book. Um, but in that, <laughs> uh, where they blew like all of their budget, their entire budget was on the, when they go to Israel and there's these massive, almost towers of uh, zombies all climbing over each other to try and scale these walls. And that was the sort of thing it, it gave to me. Not this, it was kind of a maelstrom of, of feral children rather than just individuals. I'm a curious about how they're going to do this visually in the show i don't know somehow i feel like actually getting kid actors to do this on screen like it's gonna be a lot creepier when you can see it versus just reading about it i can imagine that they would just have less kids like that it would just be the the sibling kids coming after them but i guess they have to make it seem threatening i don't know eh, we'll see that we shall Least faves? Who's gonna go? I can go first. Uh, so, 
I did like a lot of the Lee and John stuff, but I also, there was a lot in it that just felt like John is telling us about these things he can do, but we never, we never get to see them. We never get to know why he seems to have developed powers in this other world. <laughs> like, right. what happened yeah. there? You know, I just feel like we're getting this teeny, 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 teeny look through an exposition dump of a lot that went on. Yeah. Do you think like I was thinking about that, too. Is is the implication there that like in Lyra's world, you can just do shit like this or can he do that like back in our world? I got the idea that the implication was that he went to Lyra's world and met up with this tribe and they taught him. Or like, yeah. like they saw that he had the potential so that so that they he like, I don't know, apprenticed to another shaman. Like this is all in my head, though, because right. we get nothing. Yeah. And I definitely got the feeling that the trepanning was key to him opening up his powers. Hmm. So, like, yes, I guess potentially if he had cut a hole in his skull in our world, maybe he could have also had some of the same powers, but we just, like, our cultures have not locked into that the same way that they have in this world, potentially. I don't like that. I I like for, I like for Lyra's world to be magical and, like, ours to not. Well, you can put it together with, like, how we've been seeing these trepanned, whatever the past tense of that is, skulls all over the place and how it's sort of implied that they have opened themselves up to more dust and therefore more knowledge and more experience. So through the learning and the cutting out of his head, <laughs> <laughs> as you do, made him able to spirit travel or something, whatever the fuck he was talking about in this. Maybe I'm... Yeah, I was watching Cora last night, so maybe I'm a little messed up in my head about spirit travel. But uh... <laughs> I d I do feel that the this is one of those threads where don't pull on it too much, or the whole thing unravels. You just got to sort of suspend your disbelief because it it's not that consistent. I was kind of laughing through this part where it was like Lee was like, "Well, have you noticed the wind is blowing the wrong way?" and and then he was like, don't worry about the wind. I will make wind. And I was like, <laughs> he said he'll make wind. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> you, you, you do realize you're the oldest one on this podcast and you're I know, making the fart like, jokes. <laughs> <laughs> because before Lee made gas for the thing, I was like, this is funny. <laughs> Although I guess I really funny. also you're the only one with kids and kids love fart jokes, so <laughs> Oh my kids are, are way into poop and fart. They like that. <laughs> I do hope uh Pullman was like giggling to himself when he wrote these sentences. <laughs> and just like maybe wind. an editor won't catch this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell them that and I meant he was farting. Um <laughs> 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 uh, the thing that I didn't like also stunk um that's a oh, that's a segue that bad. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's why i put a lampshade on it um uh i really don't like this l section that we get of will like listening through the uh, window between worlds to mrs coulter and he's like wow she sounds hot like i wish i could see her it doesn't really bother me necessarily that Will is like curious or attracted to her, except that we haven't really gotten anything like that from Will. And there's nothing to mirror it in Lyra to make it kind of like a theme that we're exploring, a kind of sexual awakening in these characters or anything. It feels like it's about Mrs. Coulter and about her hypnotic powers of seduction over men in a way that is like obnoxious and conspicuous and uh and and I feel like it even cheapens Mrs. Coulter on a certain level where she's not even trying to get Will hypnotized or interested in her she's just unconsciously able to do it uh so it's not even about her capabilities or facility with like social engineering 
It's just like some kind of embedded intrinsic trait of hers. So she doesn't even get credit for it. Uh, I disagree. Because oh. she is she is turning it on for Lord Boreal right there. So like as a side effect, it's working on Will yeah. too? Yeah. So like I don't disagree with your point in general. I just mean she's not turned off right there. You know what I mean? She's she's using her mystique. Or That's whatever. a good point. Yeah, she is she is trying to coerce him. That part didn't leap out to me as much as when he does actually finally see her and oh, ugh, yeah. When he saw her lovely in the moonlight, her brilliant dark eyes wide with enchantment, her slender shape light and graceful. It just I did not buy that in that moment, given that, like, his hand is fucking throbbing, he's in the middle of trying to pull off this heist, that he would, like, have the brain space to be sexually attracted to her and, like, yeah. have that be at the forefront of where his mind was. That doesn't take brain space. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what I actually think is happening here is... Pullman needed to write a bit where Will is affected by Mrs. Coulter before the next book. Mm. And this is the only time he's going to see her. So he just tried to shove something in, you know, and it just doesn't quite work. Mm. Yeah, it feels off. Yeah, it doesn't feel consistent to Will. And it feels centered on Mrs. Coulter in a way that is strange. And in the same way that like Philip Pullman is always trying to characterize his adult characters by like making them weirdly sexy in a way that I do not appreciate. Like the way that he tries to build up Ruta Scotty by having her fuck Asriel or like build up Mrs. Coulter by having everyone be like needlessly attracted to her. It just like, I feel like there are other types of power besides sexual power and it feels cheap that that's the well that he keeps going back to. I don't mind it in Mrs. Coulter specifically because I do think that is the only way that she has learned how to control men. And she likes to control the powerful men around her. But it has to be done right. And I do think he messes it up a lot. Yeah. No, I don't think that it's bad for Mrs. Coulter. Like most of the time I really like watching her put the whammy on people. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think Alan really hit the nail on the head for it with me because he wasn't trying to direct it at will. It, yeah. see, it cheapens it because it's, it's like not intentional, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, I, get, I get that. Have get you that. ever been in a room where like someone is flirting with the person next to you really hard? Like that's, you don't, you can tell when that energy is not directed at you and it doesn't affect you the same way. Um, in a similar vein to uh, to Alan's point, I felt that Will's first impression of Serafina was again very like surface level, and for for a lad who's so insightful and so you know deeply observational, it feels like a clumsy representation of puberty rather than any like you know I've I've been a teenage boy and like. Yeah, they can be bad, but I, that particular level of preoccupation with all of a sudden women exist is a little. It just it just doesn't quite wear right. It doesn't feel doesn't feel sensible. It doesn't feel like that's the sort of thing that he'd be thinking about in these times. He'd be thinking, "Oh my god, am I going to get killed by these people who were shooting me? Are they anywhere near yet?" Um, <laughs> yeah, um, the just it's just the trope is wearing thin now. We've we've seen this a few times. It could have been fine once or twice, set it up for future things with Will, but right now, like we've seen it, yeah. He he looks at women and sees them as women. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It just didn't sit right with me. I maybe I wasn't paying much attention, but I read that bit completely differently. But again, maybe I just wasn't paying attention because I don't remember. No. I I genuinely don't remember him mentioning her beauty, but just like the grace of how they flew, and that he was impressed by that, not necessarily attracted to it. But maybe that's just me being naive, <laughs> having not been a teenage boy. Yeah. 
Well, here, here we are. Here's the, here's the section, and I quote, But Will couldn't do what he intended, because at the same moment a witch landed her branch on the grass beside him. He was taken aback, not so much by her flying as by her astounding gracefulness, the fierce, cold, lovely clarity of her gaze, and by the pale, bare limbs, so youthful and yet so far from being young. End quote. I guess that would have been fine if he didn't mention the bare limbs. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's in that hindsight. That's exactly what it is. It's like, it's like okay, so you're looking like you can say someone looks youthful whilst also oh, like that would come across in the eyes so much more than someone's forearms. <laughs> their shins, yeah. their shins were particularly youthful. Well, no, not really. <laughs> Oh my god, if we did cute episode titles, I feel like this episode should be Youthful Shin, or particularly Youthful Shins, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's unfortunate. I just remember him saying the graceful and the intense, or the fierce, I guess. I guess I just sort of picked and chose what I liked. <laughs> it is crazy. It's like she launched like 30 arrows before they hit their target, and she flew through the air, and Will is like, nice stems. It's like <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, he could he could have at least pulled it off in the like classic young lad doesn't know what he's doing vibe and be like, yeah. "Ah, you've got you've got nice legs. I've got legs." Yeah. Put him wrong-footed. <laughs> like make him the wrong one in the situation, but that's not how it that feels. Been, it would have been I, so much I, better as well. I get the impression that Philip Pullman doesn't know what he's doing with that. Yeah. Like, he's unconscious. Because, yeah. Because he doesn't ever have Will do anything like that again, especially directed at Serafina. No, I think you're no. totally right. I think, like, Philip Pullman does a lot of things really well. Writing physical descriptions of women is not one of them. And I think yeah. his own attraction to his female characters leaks through his writing more than it should. Like, yeah, absolutely. maybe yeah. if he, like, went home and wrote some fanfic about his own books <laughs> and just got it all out in that way. Yeah. Leave it out of the regular books. That's funny. <laughs> compartmentalize. Are any of the women described as not attractive? Like, some mm. are described as sort of plain. That's, that's not fair, though, because no book does that. No book says here is this good character who is not attractive in any way unless they're specifically making like a joke or a point of it. I mean, do you like, get the nobody... idea that John Farr is particularly stunning? This Adonis of a boatman? I, that's kind of what I meant by like, we don't see anything like this in Lyra. Like she's not, she's not like, oh, he stole my alethiometer, but he's older and powerful and hot. And oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I must. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing like that to it's this is not a theme that we're exploring this has something to do right. with mrs coulter like anya said he's attracted to mrs coulter his own creation in a way that's like conspicuous and weird i i'm i'm not against that i'm just saying no books no male author ever has created <laughs> a female main character who wasn't like a mom or, or you know what i mean who wasn't like ma costa yeah. and been like man she's not hot yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I just did, I think that's an unfair question to ask of this one man. <laughs> but <laughs> shouldn't we be not, asking I think a question that we should ask of everybody. Yeah, yeah. No, yes, ask ab all absolutely. Men? Absolutely. What I'm yeah. saying, though, is we if we're not going to hold that standard to the rest of the books that we read, why? Let's flip that on its head briefly and look at uh, Stephanie Meyer. Uh, how we I think we get pretty good insight into what she thinks about young men who are a bit wolfish, <laughs> a yeah, bit sparkly. One hundred. I don't have any problem with people deciding to write books or any sort of you know storytelling medium that's like I'm going to tell a story about hot people and I'm going to make them have drama. Be like that's fine. Yeah. But oh, also, but that's like, just, that that right. isn't what that is not what Philip Pullman is doing, right? And, so it right. does stand out when he does this stuff, right? And right. like yes. Twilight yeah, is basically an adventure romance, right? Like the the target audience yeah. is women who are supposed to both be into Edward and Wolf Guy, um, Jacob. Oh my god! <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, the right okay, one, Jacob. 
<laughs> the less Again, wrong like... one. <laughs> the correct yeah. choice. The less bad choice. <laughs> um. Any anyway. Right, but like that's not the point of this. The point of this book is not for the reader to like be super into Mrs. Coulter. Well, I mean, I'm a reader who's super into. Mrs. I mean, that's true. We do. <laughs> This just speaks about you, I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> that's just me, I guess. We did name our episode Ruth Wilson, Please Hurt Me, but that's like not really the full point of the... And I, I will say a lot of that is, is Ruth w- Wilson, because I, I don't feel that way about Nicole Kidman, so... Yeah, <laughs> but um, okay, the point is, my least favorite part of this book um, <laughs> in this section... <laughs> Good segue there. Um I really did not like the whole thing where, like, they're running away from the kids, they go up the hill, and then when Will cuts through the world, they're, like, up high above traffic, because I feel like it breaks my suspension of disbelief about how the the subtle knife works at all. Like... Is it basically saying... I have have a rebuttal. Okay, you do? Please fix this for me. But it makes me wonder, like, does this mean that the elevation at literally every other point in the world that they've tried so far exactly matches up? Like, wouldn't... Just given the way that elevation works in general, you'd think that, like... I don't know. I mean, I guess their worlds are kind of mirror worlds, but Sagatsa's not a mirror world's. It's and if it is, it's like fucking Italy. So I would just imagine that, like, given randomness, you know, like ninety percent of the time when you cut through, you should get like either a bunch of dirt or be elevated in the sky. It seems unlikely that like this is the one place where the worlds wouldn't match up. Okay, so my rebuttal or shit, no, it doesn't rebuttal. Fuck. Well, I know. Um, I do have a rebuttal. Because when what's his face Asriel opened the big thing, it shifted everything. Mm-hmm. That caused a big problem for stuff. So I know the already open windows they all moved, and that might cause a problem with like where you're opening to now. If that makes any sort of sense, maybe. Right, I don't and like the Oxford other is mapped to Sidigatse in a way that is weird. Yeah. yeah. And my other thing is when you say about how. Um, you know, 90% of the time you'd be opening into dirt or into high up in the air. That is addressed in book three. Oh, it is. Okay. Because then then maybe maybe this is fine. But at least from my experience reading this book right now, this it felt like a bad writing choice to me because it made me question like the physics of the knife and the world in a way that I had not questioned up until this point. Uh, and it made me feel like it was broken. Just as another rebuttal to it, um, you know they're up in the Belvedere, and the Belvedere is a building used to uh, you take advantage of a particular view. So you go up; it's a viewpoint. Right. So they climb. So they've uh, the implication I feel is that they've climbed fifty feet up, and then they cut through, and then it turns out that when you go up fifty feet and then cut through, then you're fifty feet above the ground still. Like I understand that they should be elevated, being like in the building but Mm -hmm. i feel like the ground level should map even if you go up 50 feet up and then through to a different place but the 50 50 feet feet up up shouldn't matter because otherwise like i mean how is why is that hill different from just like any other more gentle change in elevation wait is building the building is 50 feet tall I didn't get maybe not. Maybe the buildings. Are... Maybe it's. A... He mean, makes it sound true. like it's because of the slope of the earth. Yeah, I. The one thing I can think with that, like if if the Chitagatse is mapped to Oxford, and what I said was just bullshit, uh, <laughs> then the answer to that is they. Nope, I got nothing actually. No, see, I think it can't be mapped to Oxford because it's sea- it's seaside. But it, Oxford is not seaside. Right? No, I get. I'm not saying that the world is shaped the same. I'm just like they could have a completely different continental drift gotcha. or whatever. Yeah. What the fuck I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, see, um, I, see, I see. I see. But the physical space absolutely has to be because of how they did the heist. See, I think it would have worked if he had mm-hmm. said that they were like 15 feet in the air, and it was because they were elevated in the building. But the fact that he 
very clearly in the text implies that it's because they walked up a hill doesn't work for me. I think the reason that that happens is a consequence of the heist itself. He slices with the knife and then he's like, oh, the cabinet's over there. And then he walks over there the appropriate amount of feet and then slices again. And now he's right there at the cabinet and he sees the alethiometer is not there. And so then he moves behind the couch. He's not moving things with the knife itself. He's like moving through space in both worlds simultaneously. Right. Mm -hmm. And that so those are like the rules of the knife. Because of that, in the situation that they're in, he keeps the rules consistent between the heist and this escape in a way that I appreciate. Okay, I don't think that my complaint is inconsistent with what you just said, right? Because there's two possible ways that Oxford could map onto Sagatsa. Like, they could map exactly in 3D space, where going up a hill in one world then puts you suspended in the air in the other. Or it could be that the surface of the ground is somehow... The surface of the ground on the other side. Right, and then it's it's relative, it's like the, uh, the difference relative to the wherever ground is. From my perspective, it makes more sense that it would be the difference of relative distance from whatever the ground is in Z plane space and X, Y works normally. Mm -hmm. Am I explaining this well at all? Um, Oh, I get what you're saying. yeah, Yeah, because if it is actual like specific distance from like the center of the earth or whatever, Mm -hmm. Then it seems, like I said, it just seems like you would get dirt or sky most of the time. Because, like, the the Earth is truly not flat, right? Like, most places are, like, elevation varies widely over space. I think narratively, though, like, see, we're, we're, like, debating the physics of this, which I think is good. And it says something in itself. Like, I don't disagree with what you're saying. But it says something about the level of rigor that's being presented to us in terms of a magical system. Uh, And it reminded me of um, the author, fantasy author, Brandon Sanderson. He has a narrative theory around magic. He calls it the law of magic. Um, Well, he has three laws. Um, But I just uh, was reminded of the first law. Uh, And the law says that an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the audience understands that magic, which is kind of the issue that you're having. Um, Like, why won't this issue? Why can't we solve this problem with the knife? Uh, I'm confused, right? Um, But in the other case, with the heist, we understood completely that he had to move this many feet and then he cut the hole and then he moves this many feet and he seals this one up and he opens that one. Like we understand the mechanics of how the knife works. And so it becomes just another narrative tool to kind of add drama and tension in the story. And magic does not become like this easy fix to plot problems. That is like always the um, criticism of fantasy as a genre. Like, well, you just do whatever. And then you wave a magic wand and poof, the problem is solved. Right. That's not the case with the magic knife. It follows certain rules, and we expect those rules to like map across different situations. And so when it doesn't map in this other situation, it's confusing. I wasn't thinking too hard about it during the heist, and then now I'm like thinking too hard about it in a way where it's like, I want to pull on the thread. I didn't notice the thread was there, and now I want to pull on it. <laughs> but I think that... Brandon Sanderson's law like kind of holds true there that it's directly proportional to how well you understand the magic in terms of how satisfying it is. Like if you're confused or if you don't understand the magic at all, like we were talking about earlier with Grumman and the wind, Mm -hmm. like it just seems arbitrary and convenient, right? It's like tap your heels three times and there's no place like home. Like I could bitch. I couldn't have done that at the start. What the fuck? No, I definitely agree. And this is why I want to talk about the name of the wind on our other podcast with you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's that's a good example, too. That is like my favorite magical system. In the the heist, I thought it was a really good example of Sanderson's law of magic there. And what you're pointing out is an interesting 
corollary to it where it it's actually causes a problem because you don't understand exactly how the knife works i mean we're also making an assumption anyway that there everything is exactly the same in throughout basically the whole of space such that the orbits are the same right right oh right. yeah because yeah. you could end up <laughs> you, in you, space the planets in the same <laughs> yeah. yeah right yeah, remember See, we're like... moving at thousands of miles an hour there's so much that has to be the same for them to be in the same place unless there's something else tying them together which isn't just the physical world and because of kepler's laws of planetary motion the speed of the planet is different depending on where you are in the orbital <laughs> ellipse so funny. right like yeah, it right. just opens up so many things and literally all it had to be was that when he was in the temple, he cut a window and he was like 15 feet in the air and in the middle of a busy road. And it wouldn't have fundamentally changed the situation, but it would have uh, not led to all of this like existential confusion about how the world works. But I think at the same time, Pullman does give himself a way out here because when Grumman talks about the knife, he says it has powers that even the people who made it don't understand or know about. And so it could be the case, and this is like total fan theory bullshit, that like the knife works the way that it does because that's how Will thinks the knife should work. You know oh, what I mean? Oh, interesting. So like with, if you used it, it would work the way that you're saying, you know, where it doesn't matter what your elevation is or I wouldn't have to go just to Oxford, but it's because Will thinks I can only go to Oxford that he goes to Oxford. Yeah, so that was my other question that I was going to bring up later, but I guess, yeah, to talk about it now, that is the other question that it brought up is like, how, yeah, how does he, when he's using the knife, is it just his intention that determines which world he cuts into if there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of other worlds? Addressed in book three. talked about later. Yeah. 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 And and that's okay. the that's another one of Brandon Sanderson's rules is that you know, have rules, but you don't have to lay them all out for the characters or for the readers. Like the rules are consistent across the books, but he doesn't understand how to use it, you know. And so when you look back, you're like, "Oh, this all works now that I understand the rules." This is like if you're writing for a pen and paper RPG, and if you're writing say a trap room, then you're going to want to write maybe like I I've done a whole small kind of PDF supplement just on random traps to add to your to your dungeons, and the whole point is that you think of like maybe ten or so ways that you can solve this room. You're trying to predict what people are going to think, but just because you know of these things and you know that you're handling. Uh, what happens if they try and drill into the rock doesn't mean that when you when they enter the room you say if you try and drill into the rock then x or the rock (laughs) looks too the rocks looks like it'll actually turn into lava if you drill and drill into it you just make that the so it's there and if they try and do it then it happens but they don't need to know know all the rules as long as they are consistent and then they can look back later and they say oh oh my god like i look you know you, you talked about all these all these ropes that were hanging in the ceiling I and mean, then they, they they come to it ten rooms later, and they've gone over the top, and they see where all these ropes go to, go to, and they actually go to a bunch of I don't know knives or marbles or something like that. Like, yeah, it's it's just about writing with consistency, even if not everyone knows that it's consistent. Yeah, because otherwise there's no drama, right? It, because yeah. it feels arbitrary, and that was the big criticism of fantasy in the 70s and 80s because you had a lot of writers who like read Tolkien and tried to do Tolkien and didn't understand that he did have a system but like he just never explained it the way that you do in more modern like you know the way that Sanderson does or the way that Rothfuss does um and I then, disagree with that statement but let's not get into that well and and it still follows uh Sanderson's law of magic and narrative even though there is a system in Lord of the Rings world we don't understand that system and magic almost always makes things worse in that world in terms of the plot like it complicates things more than it solves them just like buffy right and so that works because you don't understand magic and it makes things worse it's not unsatisfying if you don't understand magic and it solves things, then it's like Dorothy clicking her heels and you're like, this is bullshit. I don't care about this story anymore. So I think Pullman is part of a movement of fantasy writers who are like correcting the course of 
the way you write fantasy in the 90s so that there are rules so that you can have drama, so that you can have stakes and investment and everything else that good literature should have. I have no idea where we are or what we're talking about or what's next or what's going on. Problematics. Uh, Problem is problematic. Yeah. Oh, okay. So my question to you guys is how do we feel about the Tartar tribe? Like to me, it definitely had some deepest, darkest Africa vibes that I did not appreciate, even though it was like in the Arctic. It's. I mean, I, they I even don't... like go on a boat up the river. That's like literally heart of darkness. <laughs> I mean, I I got the feeling that he was thinking more sort of First Nations style, but it generally felt like generic tribe of uncivilized people mixed with ha ah, shamanism. Shamanism is cool and interesting and mystical. I'm genuinely surprised Lee didn't go on an ayahuasca retreat and then just have some epiphany. Do they have ayahuasca in the UK? No. Okay, I was going to say, I thought that was some American white people bullshit. No, that's South American shamanism. And yeah, yeah and, and going on ayahuasca retreats is the white, the white people bullshit. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, just, it just sort of had that feel to it of, here, have a token reference to tribal cultures. Nothing, nothing vaguely engaging with actually, what does that tribe feel? I do think I I agree and it's bad but it it's because we don't get John's story other than as like info mm-hmm. dump. Mm-hmm. Because I do think again in book 3 Philip Pullman shows that he absolutely can have a visitor to a completely different culture learn that culture and be become a part of it in a good unproblematic way as far as I remember. I'd need mm-hmm. to check on that but yeah I think you were right. It is it is problematic in the way that it is presented here, but again, I think that's just because we don't get John's story. I would have liked to have John's story, though. Like, I can't... Yeah, no, so would I. It, yeah. I don't know. I, d- I just can't sit here and say, well, it would have been nice with this, because, like, he... This is what this is what he wrote, and I, yeah. I, I, I yeah. think he should have given, given us a bit... I mean, again, I, I was saying earlier, I loved the way that he included you know this all as hints and as you say it just feels a little bit odd to suddenly have it as an in- info dump it would be nice to have this continue and then eventually you do piece it all together and you go oh rather than halfway through he just kind of yeah. seems to get bored of the idea i feel like it would have been cool if maybe i don't know if maybe like lee had found letters that he'd continued writing oh, yeah. to back to his wife oh. that like went over everything that had happened and then we could see how he became a part of this tribe and and how and more about becoming a shaman and and have it be like a real thing that happened in the story and not like oh we found john he's got magic powers (laughs) yeah i think they should i think philip should have done it in as a separate little book so he mentions that lee finds it and generally has a few excerpts and then Philip yeah. Pullman separately published a whole book, which is the letters from John Parry yeah. to his wife. And it's it's almost like Philip Pullman has done exactly that with other things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, he, he has. Yeah. There are just like a couple other things that I feel like Pullman had to consider. Like, I feel like part of the reason why he, he went the tribal route is because... Right in Lyra's world, the Magisterium controls everything. So, in order for John Perry to be operating independently, right, he can't be under Magisterium control, and there are no other states or powers that could possibly stand up to the Magisterium. There's only these like remote, dispersed tribal like peoples so i think that's like one of the reasons why he went there and then the the other thing that i wanted to say is just that it feels a little bit problematic that you have this whole tribe of people who are basically just like in service to this white man who's been there for about like 15 years you know, they've, like, literally upended their whole culture, their whole, like, reason for existing to, like, serve this white man. Yeah, I think that's the bigger problem for me. Yeah. If the marginal 
tribal cultures are portrayed as like heroic versus the magisterium, I think that's actually making a political statement about, you know, like white supremacy and, you know, Christian supremacy and stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, but like to have this white saviorism where the white person comes into a native group and then becomes its leader because they best understand both worlds is a very problematic trope in storytelling. I agree. I just want to say he's not their leader. But it feels like he is. Sure. Yeah, he's not the headman. You're yes. right about that. He's like a he's a spiritual leader though, in in that he's a shaman. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. I'm not saying it's not problematic. Yeah. I just yeah. wanted to No, I Alan, I think you bring up a really good point. Like it would have been so cool if we just got like a little bit more about like Maybe this tribe is helping him because they hate the Magisterium and they know that he's fighting against the Magisterium. So it's like yeah. a strategic alliance that gives them like more yeah. agency and purpose. Yeah, it's like Star Wars. It's like, yeah. you know, all the yeah marginal, more ethnic style people are part of the rebellion. And oh, look, a Jedi. Cool. We could really use you. Yeah. You know? It's like he's serving them rather than them serving him. Yeah. It's even possible that that's what Pullman meant to write, but because he doesn't give us any of John's story, basically, mm -hmm. it just comes across mm -hmm. as the bullshit. Did they ever like say our tribe is this or the the tribe is called that? Are they only called Tartar people? It's possible that I don't know that the tribe ever says that, but it's possible that when um, Lee was questioning the people at the conservatory or not conservatory, observatory, um, that they said, you know, he is he was part of this tribe or or, or the, the dude that gave him the answers. But other than that, but I don't think so. I think he just said the tribe up the river. Yeah, because even the name Tartar is comes from like, you know, Tartarus, like hell. That's what Europeans called the people who lived, you know, like Anatolia, Mongolia, and stuff like that. They were like, oh, those are hellish people. They are Tartars. Oh, interesting. They are of Tartarus. I yeah. had no idea. I was definitely in my head, like he mentions deer. I was kind of imagining like a Sami type people. The I think the witches are the stand in for the Sami. Oh. Okay. Which we did discuss previous book, mm -hmm. but that was like a year ago. So <laughs> also problematic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Anywho's, uh, shall we move on to the empty science section? Yes, and then quickly yep, nothing to say here. Quickly <laughs> move on to religion. <laughs> ah, religion. Yes, we did. Yeah, we already did talk about spatial physics and the x axis and the y axis. Yeah, and uh, we we did trigonometry this week. Uh, and that is quite enough science. Elliptical orbits. Yeah, Kepler. Mm. You said yeah. Kepler. That I, counts. I did say Kepler. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could talk about whether the everything. I get no, it just doesn't work. There's, there's no way to make it work. I was trying to come up with some bullshit physics. It Lagrangian points aren't going to work here. Just no. <laughs> Onwards, religion. Someone knows something about this. <laughs> yeah. So in religion, I see more fate going on. Uh, Kate already mentioned this. How you know, like in the previous book, uh, Lee just all, you know all of a sudden just twigs to like. Grooming's dead, you say? I doubt it, and I'm gonna go check it out. Uh, <laughs> it's like okay, I guess. And you know, like what is what is making that happen, right? And we've seen this before. We talked about it, I think, in our second episode when the kids first get to Sitagatse. They think, you know, like, hey, that house would be a good one to stop at. Why that house? Well, because of fate, right? Um, because something's kind of pushing them to do it. And was it fate that's pushing Lee here? Or is it Grumman's magic? Is it just Lee's personal curiosity? Or are all those things synchronized in a way that, like, is that what magic is? Is kind of the synchronicity of people's wills and of the necessity of, uh, you know, time and history Christianity has had that idea for a long time called Providence with a capital P, Providence. Uh, I think I talked about this before in our second episode. Just the idea that like God is out there. He's not pulling strings necessarily, but that there are 
uh, you know, human intentions out there. We make choices. And just like Lee decides, well, I want to help Lyra. Well, then a, a supernatural force intercedes in that decision and says the best way to help Lyra is to find Grumman. And so he's like, I'm going to find Grumman. Kind of apropos of nothing. Can I interrupt? I just have a question. Let's say all this is what's happening in the book. And don't think of it as like a book. What do you think is the the providence? Because... That's the question, right? Like, what do you think is pushing them? Well, it's that's interesting to me because it feels... It doesn't feel benevolent, necessarily. It feels like these characters are kind of... You know, Francis earlier mentioned Cabin in the Woods... And, and it's kind of like that kind of providence where somebody is mm-hmm. down in the deep basement pushing buttons that makes this otherwise smart individual into a, a dumb blonde stereotype. You know what I mean? Like the characters right. are kind of getting pushed around on a certain level. And that's what this feels like as opposed to other books where providence feels more benevolent. And I think that's intentional. I guess I just the book seems to be setting up, you know, God as the bad guy. Right. Yeah. So I would just be interested in who we think is manipulating our good guys, quote unquote, to all meet up to do what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I I'm, I think that is the, you know, kind of evil God, if we have to name it something that or the God that I'm very suspicious of. I think that that is the same God who puts Lee and Grumman together and puts the subtle knife in Will's hand and is moving all this stuff because the direction that all these characters are moving in doesn't feel benevolent to me. Like things are getting worse and worse and it's not that they are fighting against Asriel. It, it feels like Asriel is the only one who's fighting against it and they're actually caught up in its schemes Re- I don't um, get that feeling at all. Yeah. That's how I read the book so far. I really don't remember the third book like super oh, okay. clearly. I remember, you know, like the big the big steps. But I'm not like aiming this at a you know, a deep knowledge of the story. Okay. I definitely get the feeling that like if if religion uh, the magisterium are the bad guys in these books, whatever force is causing Will and Lyra to have met up and now like Lee and Grumman to be on their way to meet up with them, that that's the opposite of the magisterium. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess it does have a name, the authority, right? Like we've already heard that. Yeah. 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 That's fair. The authority. And, And so I feel like Will and Lyra are caught up in the authorities like thing. And, uh, and that, you know, Asriel is, is working against that. Like, I think that Will and Lyra believe they are working against the authority, but in fact, they are being, like, drawn into a trap exactly where the authority wants it, you know, Uh, so they're vulnerable kind of a thing. Uh, You know, like, to go back to Star Wars, like the the Emperor and uh, Return of the Jedi or something like that. I gotcha, I gotcha. So Luke thinks he's done all the right things and he's given his father a second chance and, oh, the rebellion is vulnerable now and everything is going to go to shit because you did exactly what I thought you would because good is stupid and evil is smart. So in this metaphor is Grumman Darth Vader? (laughs) No, Grumman is Yoda. (laughs) Right. He's like, you know, unwitting... uh, unwittingly a part of the plan i think and so like i see this kind of providence in the background in terms of the way that the characters are being manipulated you know like in any story characters are manipulated obviously because it's a story but i think that it's like elevated in this the same way that it is in other fantasy novels that have a kind of providence embedded in them but it's um but it's like a, the negative, the photographic negative version of that. It's like, it's ominous. And, uh, or it is to me. That's how I'm reading it anyway. Um, but if there, even if there is a providence that's benevolent, that's helping these characters to fight against the authority, that still limits the amount of free will that these characters have, right? 
Um, how much is Lee deciding to go see Grumman? Is Grumman making that choice for him? Does Lee just have an illusion that he's making that choice? Does Grumman have an illusion that he's making Lee make that choice while something else is making him make that choice for Lee? You know, like how deep does that go? And how much freedom does anybody have? Uh, that's the kind of thing that when I talk about Nietzsche and talk about like, you know, the eternal recurrence and stuff like that, that's how he kind of saw the universe as we don't have a lot of choices. You know, you, you don't have a choice of where you were born. You don't construct yourself. You're kind of constructed by society. And then once you wake up to that fact, what are you going to do about it? You know, what, how much responsibility are you going to take for the way that your society is and how it treats you and how it treats other people? And what are you going to do now that you see the light? Uh, are you just going to sink back into your role? Or are you going to uh, tweak things to your advantage, kind of like Mrs. Coulter, and, you know, just do things uh, so that they shake out the best way for you? Or are you going to try and fix the world the way that Lord Asriel is trying to do it? I think this is all very Nietzschean in terms of like the way that Lee feels in, in, in the chapter with Grumman, where he's just like thunderstruck by that ring and by like, I don't know who sent me here. I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know that I care about Lyra and like, why do I care about Lyra? You know, he really feels that hand of fate on him in a way that I think is important and is lampshading this idea of a supernatural fate that the, you know, and, and Lyra's whole thing is she's fated to kill fate. So this is like an important idea that happens in other fantasy stories, but it happens in a more like benevolent way. Like in Tolkien, he has this whole thing uh, in his stories that he he articulated in an essay that he wrote called On Fairy Stories. It's like a, you know, it's about how to write fantasy or his a conception of what fantasy is. Um, this idea of a you catastrophe. Um, so it's a catastrophe, but it's a good catastrophe. Um, that's what that word means, like literally. <clears throat> and everybody else calls it deus ex machina. This is the kind of thing like when the eagles show up at the last minute or um, actually the eagles showing up is a really good example of a you catastrophe. Like in The Hobbit, the the characters are at one point they're chased by all of these goblins um, out into the forest. And to get away from the goblins, they like go up a tree and Gandalf starts throwing down uh, pine cones that he sets on fire. And it starts a forest fire because Gandalf is a fuck up. And, uh, and, and then the forest fire, like, you know, sends all this smoke into the air and the eagles who are far away go like, is the forest on fire? What's going on? And they go to check it out. And there's Gandalf throwing down flaming pine cones. And they're like, Gandalf, what are you doing? And they pick him up and they get him out of there. So it's kind of a catastrophe because there's a, a forest fire, but the catastrophe itself solves the problem that Gandalf and the dwarves are having in that moment of they, they can't get away from the, uh, the goblins. And so it's a you catastrophe. It's a good catastrophe uh, in terms of the plot. And, and this was how Tolkien saw fantasy operating, that you choose the course that is the most heroic but it's that's the course that's the most likely to get you killed. And that's why you get supernatural intercession when you make that heroic choice. Like you're willing to go where you can't go, where you can't win. And so you get the leg up that you need to get the job done. And that's what fantasy is to Tolkien. That's, you know, that is what makes it different than the real world where you go out and try to be a hero and that you just die, you know, it's the, you know, you get this expression of God's benevolence in the story. And it, I feel like in his dark materials, you're getting, am I making my own choices? Is someone pulling my strings? Like this doesn't feel good. Um, am I my own master or have I been mastered by something I don't understand? Everything that I have to say about this is because I know how the story ends. So I can't can't talk about it. Like 
I, that is I think the trouble that, that I'm having as well. Yeah, like it's really. I think we could have a very, very, very interesting discussion about this around like chapter twenty of book three. <laughs> as the only person here, I think who hasn't read book three recently and doesn't remember anything about it. This I don't is... really remember it either. Okay, yeah. No, these are all the questions that I was asking too as I was reading, but I guess I didn't bring any of it up because it's for me it's hard to say anything about it not knowing where it's going, right? Like the meaning comes from how it ends and and we don't really know that yet. Yeah, and I'm I'm bringing these things up in, in exactly the way that you're saying. In like I read these three chapters and I'm like, what does this bring up for me? And I see, you know, like the literary influence of Tolkien and how that's related to Christian providence and like fate as a theme in the story. And so I'm just taking the information that we have now and then laying other frameworks that I'm aware of on top of it and not saying like, and this is how it works in the superstructure of the story, because I really don't remember. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I like that. So uh, that discussion is to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly even next chapter. Uh, the only other Nietzsche stuff that I see here is Lyra um, when she's with Will. Uh, there's a little bit of frustration that I feel with Lyra, but I also kind of really like this where after she gets the alethiometer back, she's so grateful because she feels like she really messed up uh, in not listening to it and not trusting the alethiometer and trying to do her own thing. And it got stolen, and now she's, like, all in on being Will's sidekick, on completing his quest and doing what she's told and nursing him, you know, to health and making sure he gets washed and bandaged and all of the things that she needs to do to help Will. She'll cook omelets for him, even though she's terrible at it, <laughs> and do whatever she's got to do. It seems like a threat when she says that. She's like, I'll cook you <laughs> omelets. <laughs> I don't think I, I will. really do it. I don't think I really appreciated just how big of a character turn this is for Lyra, because like Golden Compass Lyra would never just do what she was told, um, right? And she was all about making her own decisions, her own path, just like doing whatever she wants. So um, it's it's quite impressive, I think, that Pullman has arced her this far in a way that I like barely even noticed that this was such a dramatic change. Because it feels so natural that that's what she would do. Mm -hmm. I, I do know a lot of people who hate it. Really? Yeah. Think it's, who think it's a gross betrayal of the character and very much being like, here's this great female, female protagonist. Oh, wait, here's a male protagonist. Fuck the female protagonist. Mm -hmm. I can see why people would feel that way from a meta perspective, mm -hmm. but I buy it from a character perspective. I do like, too, I think, which is, yeah. Yeah, I think getting Sorry. the alethiometer stolen and also the trauma of losing Roger like yeah. Alan said, is like it's enough to to rock the the like fundamental nature of her personality. I also think yeah. that, and yeah. even her her ability, like her number one thing is you know Lyra Silvertongue. She she can talk her way into and out of anything, and that has not helped her at all this book. Yeah, right. you know yeah. that just gotten her yeah, in more true. shit. Right. It's and so I think a lot of this book is her realizing like. Oh, I'm great in my world, but I have no idea what's going on out here. <laughs> and that and even just like having that realization would immediately make me take a step back and be like, I'm going to follow someone else's lead for a while. Yeah, at least until she gets her bearings again. And like, yeah. her, like her confidence is shaken. Right. And yeah. and part of her doing her own thing in the previous book was her being super confident about it. I have no doubt that if she manages to regain her confidence in that same way once she feels like she's a better handle on what's going on she'll go back to more of the way that she was i even from like a outside completely meta perspective i kind of think of the books like the golden compass was lyra's book the subtle knife is will's book and then the amber spyglass is like they share that one mm, so even just yeah. from a she takes a, a step back mm. because this is will's book mm-hmm like yeah. a meta 
on a meta level so yeah. we can have narrative space for Will to exist. And- yeah. But again, I think everybody who, who reads it and just sees this awesome female protagonist take this step back for the, for this dude. Like, I think that's a perfectly valid feel because it does suck. Yeah, that's what I meant when I earlier when I said I'm I feel frustrated with this, but I also really appreciate the yeah. writing of it because I I am tugged in both directions uh with that whole thing. And it's but I think it's really uh yeah, exactly what you were saying, Anya, that her personality has been exploded, right? You know, that's what growing up is, right? You transgress these boundaries and you it's all about experience you fail you go too far you hurt people you hurt yourself and then you have to like reassess the way that you do things with that knowledge and then that's what really makes you a moral agent when you're a child and you don't understand where the boundaries are you yeah you could just lie to everyone you could just constantly lie to people because that's what works but once you have gone through ball vanger and once you've seen what Mrs. Coulter's lies do to people and to society, then you have to like reassess and be like, wait, I've seen when things go too far. I've seen when I didn't force Roger to confront the truth of the future and it got him killed. Like I need to learn how to, you know, be different. I I see that these things are, I'm going too far or I'm not going far enough. And, and that is what, growing up is it's not learning all of the right rules to follow it's about transgressing boundaries and then understanding the moral consequences of transgressing those boundaries in the future that's what makes you a bad person is because now i understand what happens when i lie to someone and i choose to lie to them anyway Uh, i choose to be like mrs coulter uh, I choose to be like Lord Asriel or like the Magisterium now that I understand completely what they are. That makes you a bad person. It's it's exploring those boundaries is like essential to, I think, to Pullman's conception of growing up and leaving childhood. And it's not about training a child how to be a good adult and then they follow all the rules and yay, you successfully crafted uh, uh, an adult what you've actually done is like now they're a grown child they don't understand the boundaries of other people or emotional reality or morality they just are good obedient rule followers right and and that's the exact kind of thing that Nietzsche talked about he called it the slave morality that people are instantiated in these institutions and they're just cogs in the machine they're not people. They don't think for themselves. They just follow rules. And then if you wake up to that and you see the reality of it, you're like, oh, I live in a white supremacist society that has a police state that is built to fuck over black people and uh, aid corporations in the confiscation of time and treasure from the people that exploit it. Uh, weird. Well, I guess I'll go back to work now and uh, just, uh, you know, keep donating to the police union because it's just too disturbing to think about and confront those facts. Well, Nietzsche would say that you're you're just falling into nihilism there. You're just falling. Well, nothing I can do about it. Not my problem. Right. That makes you a morally complicit agent in a way where it makes you worse than somebody who doesn't understand that the system is broken and bad. Um and, and the ubermensch that Nietzsche talks about, the person who overcomes their circumstances, is the person who uses their will to deconstruct the machine and to, and to make something new uh, in their own image that, uh, you know, is the type of world that they would want to live in over and over and over again, where we say Black Lives Matter and defund the police and things like that. Not to be topical in any way. <laughs> so, you know, this this is the place where Lyra is. I think she's in that middle ground where she is woken up to, oh, God, I can't live the way that I did in Jordan College 
where I can pretend like I'm at war with other children because now I am at war with other children. I understand what that actually means. It's not a, it's not a game anymore. There's really lives at stake. She doesn't know who she is, so she can't fully step into that overcoming kind of ubermensch remake the world, remake myself, um, because she doesn't understand what role to play. So she sinks back into the roles that she does understand, like nursing Will, like being a part of Will's story, being a supporting character, because that's what makes sense to her right now. That's a refuge from, you know, who she is. It's also like like Will is dying. Yeah. Oh, like yeah, he, he needed he is, it. He is sure. slowly yeah. bleeding to death. So, I mean, if you had a friend who was slowly bleeding to death, you'd probably help them. Yeah. I feel like it's not totally impossible if we had Lyra from earlier in the Golden Compass that she would help Will, but also pocket the knife or something. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> <laughs> She'd I don't be think like, she would do that. <laughs> she, she had morals about that type of thing. I, I think she would help Will, but not be quite as acquiescent it about, about it. Yeah. 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 She would very much be like, I am such a good helper. I am the best at this. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's not being like that, right? Yeah. She's sincerely trying to like, what can I do to help you? And uh, how can I use this alethiometer in the way that helps you? And as she was tying his bandage, she'd tell him a story about how she learned how to do this when traveling in the north with her father and all the men that <laughs> attacked them and blah, 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 blah. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, but she would still and save her friend. And all the said I was the best at doing it that they'd ever seen. Because <laughs> I am. T- did I mention that my dad is a bear? <laughs> my real dad. Are you a bear? Do you? How many bears do you know? <laughs> oh, you don't have any bears. So that's it. That's all the religion and philosophy. We've we finished religion and philosophy, just period. There's nothing else. <laughs> They're all done. Done, yeah. guys. It's done. <laughs> Once again, in our dust corner, there is pretty much nothing. Uh, I, get, I mean, we got some talk about the specters and how Boreal thinks they eat demons. And so he mm-hmm. wants to perform an experiment, bringing Mrs. Coulter's severed guards into Chitagatsi, which uh, made me feel like, because I pretty much said it would be interesting to see that you know last la- last episode so i i very much felt like oh maybe i've taken my curiosity too far if boreal <laughs> and i think similarly <laughs> i'm the jurassic park scientists you know <laughs> um but that's that's fine i want to talk about the fact that sir charles is lord boreal and given that in these books, clearly, like, Sir Charles is an old white dude, and in the TV show, Lord Boreal is a, like, suave and beautiful middle-aged black man. I guess I have some feelings about that. Like, I've loved Lord Boreal in the TV show so far, and the whole time we were watching season one, I was like, this is the best adaptive choice ever. Um, but now that we're here... I feel like having Sir Charles not be an old white dude actually loses something, right? Because he is like a symbol of traditional British aristocracy, old money, in a way that like doesn't work with the TV show casting. And like, so maybe that's fine. Maybe we don't need that symbolism. It's like, I guess it they don't really do that much that much with it in like the overall big picture of the book but i just i guess i wanted to hear what you guys thought about that i agree i think they have to do something completely different with him not like the big old mansion with like the yeah. rolls royce and like all that i think the tv show is going to have to be really really careful about showing like a black man stealing from this white girl you know Hmm. Oh, I didn't like, even think about it from that angle. They've got his men is so well done already that it feels like something where you can completely see him either palming it and going, "What, what, what, Ali? What?" <laughs> or you know, just just not you know, just just being so utterly menacing that the the point I feel they're trying to make is it's not a petty theft in the same manner it's a 
position of power of, oh, what? Oh, this? I've, this has been in my family for generations. Mm-hmm. Right. It just happened to be in your bag. See, but that's the weird thing, right? Is that it can't have been in his family for generations. Because, again, because he's so threatening and because he's so powerful as a person, you know, yeah, he's not old money. He's not um, House of Lords, 10 generations worth of earlships or something. But he very, very much is the sort of person who would get themselves into high places very quickly by money, by power, by manipulation, by all of that politicking. I guess I just, I want his mansion to be like, obviously new money, you know? I want it to be like, clearly was built in the past five or 10 years, like wacky angles walls of glass that kind of thing like i don't think it would work ex machina style yeah it can't central be... heating in england what <laughs> <laughs> and aircon yeah of course <laughs> yeah no like it, it can't be like a 18th century manor house you know it just doesn't work the same way i think that by setting it in the present the way that the bbc show has it actually works in its favor for doing that exact thing because like in a lot of ways uh you know that that part of england well not that i haven't been there i'm the only person on this podcast who hasn't been there but i'm gonna say it because i'm a midwestern white man and i have no fear of being wrong um is that that part of England has really surpassed places like New York uh, or other coastal American cities in terms of like its elite architecture and its uh, technological advancements on a certain level. So you could have like an uber rich guy who collects curios and antiquities and has like a display case for him and stuff like that. And I think it would wouldn't 100% feel authentic to the setting in a way that it wouldn't have if it was set in the 90s i agree the other way i would put it and i think i have a i have a particular opinion of how i see this would this going in the show is i'm not sure this is this is going to be quite a niche reference but there is a play a 16th century morality play called every man and oh, it's about i've read every that man. um you've read it um theater history so ca- <laughs> it's it's a really it's really good actually it's really interesting it and then Carol Ann Duffy re um, readapted it for modern times uh, and I saw it at the National in uh, on Southbank with Chiwetel uh, Iofa I always pronounce his name wrong uh, the guy who played oh, I love that guy Chiwetel Ejiofor yeah yeah I, I don't think either one. of those was right <laughs> <laughs> the guy who plays the operative in yeah, Serenity yeah yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, he so he is the lead character in that who and this is a 16th century european morality play it is entirely imagining a white guy being every man mm. and so that that recasting combined with how it had been reset into the modern era with massive cocaine parties and all that sort of thing you know in this incredibly elaborate set because the national it gave this very 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 modern swing to a very 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 old style thing and that same transition through to basically high power businessmen you know with links in like spying and that side of things that's the niche that um that boreal is filling in comparison to the the book version which is kind of like the 16th century morality play version of some rich old guy or Mm -hmm. some old guy Mm -hmm. or some white guy like they're recasting that and in that they're giving him a different sort of power because he doesn't have the, um, you know, thousand years worth of historical oppressing everybody else. Yeah. Which is interesting. It's we'll, we'll, It'll be very interesting to see how it flies. I agree. And I wanted to specify earlier when I said that they'd have to be careful about how he, like, invites a young white girl into his car. I mean, to not make him, like, a stereotype. Not that I think they needed... You, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, oh, nice. I, I yeah. get it, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so I know we've, like, already kind of talked the physics of the knife to death, but there's one other aspect of this that I think we should highlight um, because it's a key difference between the book and the TV show, and that's um, that in the book it says that 
all of the windows between the worlds used to go through Sagatsa, and that has changed due to Asriel opening the portal. And this cannot be possible in the TV show because there is that direct window between Will's world and Lyra's world that um, B- Lord Boreal uses, um, and that happens before Lord Asriel breaks everything open. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's something that really has to be fixed necessarily, because it doesn't seem like it has a super big impact on the story so far. Well, actually, I think, well, we did we did talk about this a little bit before in the final episode of the show. And I because I pointed out that like, hey, in the show that goes from Lyra's world to Will's world. And presumably Lyra is going to Sitagatse in the show, right? Oh, and yeah. so how is Will going to meet up with her if he goes to her Oxford? And I said, well, when Lord Boreal made the portal, it it you like hit shuffle. Oh yeah, you're you're right. I we're talking about too many people, I'm confused now. <laughs> uh, it hit shuffle on all the portals, and so that one is they're going to the same place now instead of it going to Lyra's world. That was my prediction. So I think oh, they'll yeah. still use that. I didn't even think about that because Will does. He goes through the same window that Boreal has been using to mm-hmm. get into Oxford. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we would now. think, yeah, if you haven't read the books at all, you would think just watching the show, oh, now he's in Lyra's Oxford. And but where is she? You know, and who knows? But then I think when he pops out in the same place she does, it's going to be confusing at first. And then you'll find out the reason why that happened. So you're saying basically that he pops through and then actually they're just missing the part where he's traveling through Sidagatsa. No, no, that he that he will pop out in Sidagatsa. And then we as the audience, he won't think that's weird. But we as the audience w- yeah. who haven't read the book yeah. would be Fra- like, Francis why? Francis is saying Boreal. But right. no, oh, but yeah, 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 yeah. Because then Boreal will get cool. eaten by specters if he tries to go through the hole again. Yeah, he'll he'll go there thinking that he's going to Earth. Yeah, exactly. And then he'll pop yeah. out somewhere else and he'll see people get eat by specters and be like, what the fuck, I'm out. No, uh-uh. But then he can't be Sir Charles in the same way. It's like all kind of unraveling, actually. In a no, bit of a you flow. just got to do different things, right? You got to find another. Maybe he knows about more portals. We don't know. Yeah. I mean, I I will also point out, I actually wrote this at the end, but Boreal does mention that he finds a window straight between Will's World and Lyra's because he says to Miss Coulter, mm. um, I, you know, I saw you there and then I brought you through and that wouldn't have been possible if we'd had to go through that place. And then he has to explain what Sitagatsa is. Right. Sitagatsa, right. so. So there is definitely a portal which goes straight through. So it's not just that uh, they may have all once gone through Chitagatsa, uh, but I don't think, I don't think that's true. I think, uh, yeah. I, I think he assumes, assumes that's, that's true, right? But he because doesn't that's how because it was he goes him. through it. But, but then, he, but then he goes, he goes through that portal, which is straight. That's how he finds Miss Coulter and he brings her back through. I think the idea that all windows go have to go through Chitagatsi is a misconception that the characters have, even previously to uh, Lord Asriel fucking shit up. Mm-hmm. I just think most of the windows that were left open go from Chitagatsi to another world because that's the knife's home base and presumably, until now, the bearer of the knife's home base. So, And that makes sense because they're the ones who are cutting all the windows to steal shit yeah i like that because then you don't need a metaphysical explanation for why all the like what makes chitigatsa special what makes it special is just the logistics of that's where the knife bearer lives yeah Mm -hmm. like so Mm -hmm. that there are other windows out there that have been left open just people don't haven't found them yet previous to lord asriel three yeah and because again in book three, we do see them cut through to worlds that aren't Chitagatsi from worlds that aren't Chitagatsi. Well, we even saw it in the in the last few chapters in last episode. The angels fly from one world to another and then to another. Yes. And they're like way up high. Like no one went, had a knife up there. Right. Yeah. Presumably. So like they there's other ways that this happens. So Yeah. What? 
I didn't hear you. They could have had a hot air balloon. <laughs> you know, but then we get into the whole problem that Anya had, where you're like, you're, are we flying our hot air balloon through the portal? No. <laughs> Just squeeze it down a bit. You can push it right <laughs> through. Got... Oh, it's stuck. No. Oh, no. <laughs> but, I That's mean... why it's still open. Because it fell through. <laughs> it's like, shit, why did I do that? Oh, God. <laughs> that's what they're trying to do, though, fly the, the hot air through Azrael's big-ass portal. But that's... Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I i don't know i think that's actually going to cause some problems for the tv show if they're taking the balloon because the portal in the show is pretty small maybe it gets bigger over time like they could make it you know like it's unstable or something and yeah, so maybe. it's like eating the mountain or something or maybe it just like looked small but that like beam of light going up if you fly a balloon into it you go through how did grumen get his demon is it the kind of thing where, like, if you don't have a demon and you just go to Lyra's world, it, like, pops into existence suddenly? I guess Will hasn't been to Lyra's world. They've only been in Chigatsa and in Will's world. Yeah. I'm also very curious about this. I have a theory, but it's all based on book three shit. Okay. He doesn't well, explain it at all. He says he no. just says, oh, and then I met my demon yeah it's like if if you're weird. just reading the text here it sounds like he just showed up there and then suddenly he had a bird friend well a bird right. soul or whatever which i'm actually okay with that because mm -hmm. like that's how your soul is in this world yeah no yeah. although it, that does make sense to me it causes the question of like why when lyra went to chitagatsi or will's yeah. world pan didn't immediately floop back into her exactly <laughs> maybe it, maybe it only yeah, works climbs in her ear. Yeah. one direction, <laughs> you know, like you like th once created outside the body, the demon cannot disappear. It can only come maybe. into existence. I I do have Feels a thought. Feels awfully convenient. Yeah, I do have a thought on how this works, but on how it happened. But again, it's all based on on something that happens in book three. So. Maybe there's rules about them. We don't know because nobody has done any morally good <laughs> demon experiments. <laughs> and we need to set up our own laboratory. And I'm trying not to like bang on my desk while I do this. <laughs> we need answers. We can answers. do Ballbanger right. Yeah, exactly. We can do it. Put me in charge. <laughs> I can't see anything. Of, like I, None of this could go wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And on that note, I think we're done with this episode. Join us next time. We'll be talking about chapters 12 and 13. If you like our show, please take the time to leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Anya, and you can follow me on Twitter at Strangely Literal. That's Strangely, then L-I-T-E-R-L. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. I'm Francis, and you can follow me on Twitter at Francis Windrum. Follow the show on Twitter at MOTPod. If you need more than 280 characters to speak your mind, send your emails to contact at hollowedgroundmedia.com. And remember, hordes of murderous children are always after you. And in chapter 11, the Belvedere. Sorry, give me a second. What is the Belvedere? It's the building that they end up climbing. Or It's a sitcom yeah. about Ooh. a butler and uh, some kids okay. that he takes care of. I feel of. that's a reference. <laughs> it is. To the show Mr. <laughs> Belvedere. Great. Oh, yes. It's an architectural structure cited to take advantage of a final scenic view. No, no. He's kind of like oh. a fat butler. That's what it is. <laughs> okay, and in chapter 11, the Belvedere? They weren't individual children. They were a single mass, like a tide. They surged below him and leaped... Leaped? Leapt? Is leaped a word? Did I would say leaped. I think they're both right. Okay. But I'm Midwestern, so okay. I don't know. <laughs> they surged below him and leaped up in fury, snatching threatening screaming sp spotting 
is this actually fuck i feel like i need to <laughs> i thought that i liked this and now i'm like uh second guessing my ability to write down words it's just one way to do things and she feels much more like one trick here in a way like even when she's running she's like i'm running in a hot way or something <laughs> like it's weird <laughs> she's gonna run like an anime girl <laughs> you're right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh no <laughs> uh i don't I, I don't disagree with all this i'm just <clears throat> staunchly defending mrs Coulter because i love her um it's because nicole kidman isn't scary oh yeah at all yeah yeah, but then she was also in the others, and she wasn't scary there. And that's, that's meant true. to be a horror movie. True. And that one, she's like actually a ghost. She's a ghost. Yeah, that's not scary. <laughs> Wait, is that the the? How do you fail to be scary in a ghost? <laughs> is that a spoiler that she's a ghost? That's one hundred percent a huge ass spoiler. Oh yeah, that's the whole this point of the movie. Fifteen year old <laughs> movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, was that before yeah. or after the Sixth Sense? Mm, uh, after. 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 Then oh, why did definitely. people not see it coming? Okay, never mind. Um, because it was told in a invisible. different way. Okay. Can't see it. Um, the point is... Just watch it. Just watch it. Okay. The yeah, it's good. Even though now that I know the ending... It's still it's a good still movie. Still You're the, it's still you okay. are one of the biggest... Uh, <laughs> Uh, what's people. the word? Supporters of <laughs> saying spoilers don't matter if it's still a good story. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. Because, like, I put this in here before you had this problem, but I don't want it to feel like no, I'm disagreeing I, with you. I don't feel... Well, first attack of all... Her, attack her. You're... <laughs> she deserves it. Give in to your hatred. You're allo- <laughs> all right, pal. <laughs> uh, you're allowed to disagree with me, and no, I will not feel attacked. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't... permission now. I don't disagree. Like... It's weird to me the idea that there's some kind of binary, you know, like this is I'm right about the text and you're wrong instead of like this was my experience of the text. Oh, I had this other experience. Cool. Like now I understand the story in a new way because we talked about it uh, instead of like I have to defeat your view of the like what? Why is there why is there one way to experience a story? It doesn't make any sense. But then there's also an island. uh of Canada, called Nova Zembla. Well, of course. And then there's Nova. No- it's it's not called Nova Zembla. Nova Zembla. <laughs> <laughs> I hear your deep <sighs> sigh, and I take that as victory. <laughs> Francis has left the call. <laughs> How intelligent the specters are, or like. We don't. We know nothing. We have not really been around characters that can see them and have like a history with them yet, other than Mm -hmm. the info dump about the world last chapter, or last episode. Yeah. I mean, the the implication so far is that they're kind of force of nature. They're they're not per se malicious. Well, certainly what I got from the read is that they're not malicious per se. They're just you know, they're they're just hungry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're like a menace out there, like a you know, like yeah. phantoms, like a phantom menace out there. Okay. Yeah. Jesus.
It's based on a show. Yeah, it was oh. a show that turned into a movie franchise. I but the British had the like the best. Avengers that was like their version of Mission Impossible. But anyway, which was also a movie, but that one was piss poor. Oh yeah, that's a bad movie. That was very disappointing when I was a kid. There was like, it, there's an Avengers movie, and I was like, there's no Captain America. The fuck is this? Oh, <laughs> see, I came at that from a ooh, Uma Thurman, yay! Oh no, it's. It's no good. <laughs> oh no! It's no oh good. no! I mean, could you imagine if uh, if the British had done their version of the A Team? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I want to see that, <laughs> Mr. Bean. <laughs> <laughs> Gets out of the tank backwards and <laughs> retrieves his lampshade, and toothbrush, and Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> Stop everyone, we've got to make tea. Uh, <laughs> that's I, valid though. I for one. Hmm? That's valid. Stop everyone, I have to make tea? Yes. I'm like really sad now that Lyra's world doesn't have TV because Penn would absolutely, like his personality wise, would absolutely be like, in, before Mrs. Coulter showed up, he would be, he would be singing the, uh, the Mission Impossible song. 